This is part two of the unit protista notes. We're going to beginning today talking about the plant-like protists. Remember, plant-like protists are similar to plants in some ways and different in other ways. They're similar because they do require chlorophyll to do photosynthesis. They also have some other pigments present, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, they have cell walls made of cellulose, but they don't have other things that plants have, like special tissues and roots, stems, and leaves. So they're definitely not plants. They're important for a number of reasons. One reason they're important is because of the amount of oxygen they add to the atmosphere. They probably add more oxygen than all the rest of the trees and everything else on the Earth combined. The phytoplankton are also the base of aquatic and marine food chains. They um, are everything that you eat from the ocean. Uh, usually, if you trace back to the beginning where they got their food, it was from the phytoplankton, which are kind of like the grass of the sea. There are unicellular algae, which includes a number of different kinds of organisms we'll talk about, as well as multicellular algae like the kelp and the seaweeds. Here are some pictures of some unicellular algae. These are diatoms. Diatoms are microscopic organisms that have shells made of a glass-like substance. It's actually made of silica, silicon dioxide, which is the same thing that glass is made of. Look how intricate and detailed these tiny little microscopic shells are. Very, very interesting to look at. Lots of specific, very um, intricate shells that are made by these organisms, little single-celled organisms that live inside there. These are dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates have what's called bioluminescence. That means that they can glow or give off light, like fireflies can. Um, they live in the ocean, of course, and they put, do that in the ocean. If you've ever been on a ship at night and look out at the ocean and see glittery, shiny stuff in the water, it's probably dinoflagellates. Here we have some colonial green algae, some filamentous algae here that live in water. Here's another colonial algae called um, Volvox that's made of a sphere of these little tiny individual cells, each of which has flagella. And they colonize together and make this sphere. As the cells grow and get bigger, they start producing baby colonies inside. And eventually, when the sphere gets too large to support itself, it will break open and release these new colonies to, to begin growing in the water. Very, very interesting to watch. And this is a this is another unicellular algae called Chlamydomonas. Chlamydomonas has two uh, flagella that it uses to move about. So, and that's another thing that's different about um, the unicellular algae from plants is that the, the unicellular algae are able to move from place to place. A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them have flagella or use pseudopods or something like that to move around. Now one thing we ha often have to worry about with algae is a bloom of algae. This is a rapid overgrowth of algae due to the presence of uh, organic material in the water, usually increased by an increase of nitrogen from either fertilizer runoff or accidental release of untreated sewage in the water. Just like the nitrogen in the fertilizer that you put on your yard in the springtime makes the grass get greener and grow faster, so does the nitrogen compounds added to the water accidentally or on purpose increase the growth of algae. So if you see a pond that has a big overgrowth of green stuff all over the surface of it, chances are there's been a lot of nitrogen added to the water for some reason or another. This can be harmful because as they grow and continue to populate, they end up using up all the oxygen in the, in the water which depletes the oxygen for the other animals living in the water, necessarily, uh, namely the um, fish that might live in there. So that will cause a lot of fish death, which is not fun. Um, this is a, the picture that shows here is something called a red tide. This is a, this is a bloom, it's a, but it's a bloom of dinoflagellates. And they produce, when they, when they die, a toxin in the water that kills the fish and makes the foods that you get from the water toxic to eat. So not only does it kill the fish, it also could make you sick as well. Whenever there's a red tide in an area, they put out warnings to keep people out of the water because it can be harmful to you. Um, if, you're, if you're a coastal fisherman in an area and you depend on your fishing tank to, to support your family, when there's a red tide, then you're going to be without an income for a while because not only does it kill the fish, most of the fish, the fish that might be living, uh, or have been in the water and could be toxic. And so it takes a while to recover from this. It can be very devastating to the economy of a local area. Multicellular algae look a lot more like plants than the unicellular algae do. 
but they don't have any vascular tissues or tree roots or stems or leaves like plants do. There are three main categories of multicellular algae, the green algae, the red algae, and the brown algae. All three of them have chlorophyll, just like we talked about with plants, okay? And remember, chlorophyll absorbs light from the sun in the green, I'm sorry, in the red and blue areas, but not the green. They reflect green light. What you may not realize is that when light passes into the water, some of the wavelengths of light, some of the colors of light are absorbed by the water. The, the red wavelengths of light don't travel as well through water because they don't have as much energy as the blues and the greens and the violets do. And that means the blue and the green and the violet light can travel farther down into the depths of water. So some of the algae that live farther down in the water have other pigments that can absorb those other wavelengths of light. Now chlorophyll does pretty well with the blue wavelengths and the violet wavelengths, but, they do, but it doesn't absorb green. But the red pigments and brownish pigments can absorb the green wavelengths, and so they have another way of getting energy to make ATP and an ADPH to supply the energy needed for photosynthesis to make sugars. The green algae live on or near the surface. This includes unicellular and multicellular ones and colonial ones as well. The red algaes have chlorophyll, but they also have a reddish pigment called phycobilin. They can grow deeper in the water, and uh, oftentimes you find red algae around where reefs are forming. And the brown algae have another pigment called fucoxanthin that, uh, that gives them more capability of absorbing other wavelengths of light. This includes giant kelp and sargassum, and we're going to look at some pictures of all of these in a minute. Uh, the red algae here, this is a picture of red algae, and they are very, very red, okay? So remember how green reflects the green light and doesn't absorb it, so the red reflects the red light. It might penetrate that far, but it can absorb the green, and that's really important because the green wavelengths of light can then be used to power photosynthesis. This is a green algae, a green uh, <coughs> multicellular algae called ulva, which is also called sea lettuce, and it looks a lot like leaf lettuce, but the leaves are really, really thin compared to what lettuce is. You can almost see through them. This is giant kelp, and this is sargassum. If you've ever been to the beach down at Galveston, you, this stuff often washes, washes up on the beach. And notice the little, the little ball areas here. These are air bladders. Here are some more on the kelp. These have air in them, and they help keep the seaweed afloat in the water. Now, algae can be used for a lot of different things. It can be used for food, both for animals and for humans. Um, if you ha eat sushi, then you have had seaweed. There are a number of other preparations that have, that have um, various kinds of algae in them. There are also a number of extracts that are, that are removed from various algae products and used to, for a number of different things. Thickeners for ice cream and other foods come from algae extracts. The, uh, the auger that we use in lab to grow bacteria comes from an algae extract. So there are lots of uh, different products, whether you're aware of it or not, that use um, things from products from algae in them. Now, algae and other kinds of organisms, including fungi and plants and even some animals, undergo something called alternation of generation. This is an alternation between haploid and diploid generations, um, and it cycles back and forth between one thing and the next. Remember, in, we talked about when we talked about genetics, we talked about the fact that most of your body, all of your body cells are diploid, having two copies of all the chromosomes, and your, your gametes, or sex cells, are haploid, having only one copy of the chromosomes. It's a little bit different in these kinds of organisms. There are two phases of the life cycle. The sporophyte is the diploid phase. Notice it's diploid. 2N means diploid, okay? And the sum of the cells of the sporophyte undergo meiosis, reduction cell division, to produce spores, which are haploid. These spores, shown here as plus and minus, sometimes referred to as male and female, although they're not really male and female. They're just different mating types. The spores grow into a generation called the gametophyte. And the gametophyte, although it looks a lot like the sporophyte, is ha also haploid. Every cell in this organism is haploid. The cells are produced not from, these are, the spores are produced from meiosis, but these cells are produced from mitosis, as are the gametes that can be produced by the gametophytes. The gametes are produced by mitosis from the, from the gametophyte, 
but when the gametes fuse together, they form a zygote that is diploid. Now in your Protista packet, there is a page that has a life cycle of ulva. Uh, it's a little bit different than this diagram. It, this diagram is basically upside down compared to the diagram that was in your packet. And I want you to write the, the names of the different parts, the sporophyte, which is at the top of yours rather than the bottom, meiosis, which produces the spores, the spores are haploid. The other two plants that are shown in the middle and the bottom are the gametophytes. You can label them plus and minus if you want to, or male and female. It doesn't really matter. Mitosis produces the gametes, which are also haploid, which fuse together to make these diploid zygote. I'm not going to hold you responsible for all the details of the, of the life cycle, but you do need to realize that there is an alternation back and forth between the sporophyte or the spore-bearing plant and the gametophyte or the gamete bearing plant, and that meiosis produces the spores, but the gametes and the gametophyte are produced by mitosis. Lichens are a symbiotic association between a fungus and an algae. Uh, these are really unique organisms they're, or their uh, systems. They can live even on bare rock. In our part of the country, we usually find them on trees rather than on rocks, but uh, they're very they're, um, they're very hardy, uh, can stand a lot of different things. Because they can grow on rock, they actually contribute to the formation of soil. So when we talk about succession or the development of new, uh, the growth of new life after, after a destructive event or a brand new rock surface is, is, um, is um, opened up, they assist in soil formation because the fungi part, which provides an attachment point and a collection of water, also secrete enzymes that can help break down the rock. The, the support layer of the fungus supports the algae layer, which provides food for both itself and the fungus. And so this is a very good example of a mutualistic symbiotic relationship between two organisms. There are also fungus-like protists. Most of the fungus-like protists are saprophytes, meaning they live on dead and decaying material. They absorb nu nutrients from various kinds of organic substances, they're most often found in like forests and swampy areas that have a lot of dead material like leaf, leaf litter and dead trees and things like that, plus a lot of moisture. They also go through an alternation of generations. We're not going to worry too much about their life cycle. We don't see these very often. They're often brightly colored, but they may, but they may not be. Some of them go through a part of their life cycle where they actually, actually can move around like an amoeba, but they're big rather than, than microscopic. Other fungus-like protists include water moles, which are saprophytes in water, and also plant parasites. Here's a water mold on a fish here. It's already dead. And then the water, a water mold is what caused the Irish potato famine back in the 1840s. Um, this caused that, that soil and everything in Ireland is very moist all the time. They get a lot of rain, and it's very humid there and very misty all the time. And the Water mold took over and it infected the crops and, and rotted the potatoes in the field before they could be harvested. Uh, these are all decomposers and recyclers. They help produce topsoil, but remember some are parasites of plants on land and, uh, and in the water. There are also diseases caused by protozoans. There's amoebic dysentery caused by ingesting an amoeba that can be in water that's not been totally purified. Malaria and African sleeping sickness are two diseases that are transmitted by the bites of insects. The insects are the vectors for malaria. Plasmodium is carried by the Anopheles mosquito. And Trypanosoma, the African sleeping sickness, is transmitted by the Tsetse fly. Uh, here's a life cycle of the plasmodium. In your protista packet, there are, there's a flow chart to fill out. This exact diagram is in your packet, and you can read and see what happens. The bite of the mosquito transmit, transmits the plasmodium to your bloodstream. They infect the um, liver cells, which then burst open, and then they affect red blood cells, which also burst open. Both of those things cause fever and chills, and it cycles back and forth through this, having repeating fever and chills uh, at, at several days at a time because of the rupture of the cells. African sleeping sickness is caused by trypanosoma, which has a flagellum and can move but it's carried by the Tsetse fly. This is a disease of the brain and spinal cord, and it can cause coma and death. This concludes the notes on Kingdom Protista Part 2.